Hello and welcome to the next installment of the new workspace, a guide to digital wellness and how to avoid burnout in the digital age. In this episode, we'll discuss the importance of digital wellness and how to encourage it within your organizations. I'm Safi Abadilla, Field CTO at Citrix, and today I'm pleased to be joined by Elizabeth, Kabibi and Amy. I wanna thank you three for your time and I'll get each one of you to introduce yourselves. Uh, let's start with you, Elizabeth. Safi. Nice to be on this call with you. Thank you for including me. Um, I'm Elizabeth Varghese and I lead IBM's talent and HR transformation client offerings and services. And I've worked in the HR space and you know, over the past few years, we've definitely seen the intersection of virtuality and well-being and then the pandemic only compounded it all. So I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Thanks, uh, Elizabeth. Kabibi? Hi, my name is Kabibi Springs. I'm a workplace well-being knowledge lead for Herman Miller. Um, as it relates to this topic, I'm also a PhD student in IO psychology and my work focuses around well-being and technology related stressors. So I'm very excited for this conversation today. Thank you. Now, thanks for coming along. And finally, Amy. Great. It's so good to be here with such an outstanding panel for a conversation that we're all so passionate about. I'm Amy Hayworth and I lead employee experience for Citrix and we are so intertwined uh, with well-being and understanding that to do well, we have to be well and how we do that is what I'm excited to talk more about today. Awesome. Thanks. So let's begin. You know, I guess before the pandemic, digital wellness was sort of starting to grow in importance within some organizations. But I think the lockdown really brought home the importance of employee well-being. You know, a year on from the pandemic with all of us sat at home behind PCs, Zoom fatigue, not having enough break or social connection. We have to really ask ourselves, what has that done for employee well-being? And so to kick off our discussion, I really wanted to start with defining digital wellness. You know, what is it and what does it actually achieve? Why is it important? Elizabeth, maybe we'll start with you. Sure, sure. So digital wellness, I mean, that is a fascinating topic or just the definition itself, because I think it encompasses so many different disciplines, some of which are just evolving. Um, you know, I think when we look at what we consider as digital wellness, you know, both in the work we do at IBM and outside with clients, uh, we do see wellness broadly as the ability to define boundaries, right? And uh, ability to define boundaries that are suitable or appropriate in a particular moment, whether it's with work or at home or you know outside of work. So we do find that when we think about digital wellness and helping employees and companies define it, it, it really comes down to helping them balance how they're setting boundaries, how the, the, the permeation of work and life, as we know, has, you know, that that barrier has completely gotten, um, it, it's vanished really. How that barrier is, you know, managed really is really what provides um, digital wellness overall. Um, and then the ability to feel like you have a choice in the decision. Uh, so it's one is, you know, your own volition, controlling the boundaries, controlling the barrier and then also feeling like you have the ability to do it um, is uh, I think really the most important aspect of it. Absolutely. Maybe your um, so I kind of view uh, the terminology digital wellness is like that almost that double-edged sword of technology. It is uh, both the thing that um, we suffer from and but it is also the thing that can deliver some major wellness benefits if we're using the technology in the right way. So I think we've kind of hit that tipping point where it, it has two faces. And I think that's an important point because it's the the well-being and, and the, the wellness aspect of that term is impacted by so many different things and technology does have a major impact on it. And you know, technology, I think, as you said, can be used for good, but it can be evil as well. <laughs> yes. as um, Amy? Yeah, and I think you bring up such a good point about that, that intertwining, the integration of technology with, with our lives, with the, hum, the human elements of, of life. Um, for me, digital wellness is, is really simple in that it's about this intentional relationship between us and technology. And that, that differentiator, which um, 
is so important is, is intentionality, um, being thoughtful about our technology use and when technology is the right thing for us and, w and when it's not. And that really does go back to boundaries to Elizabeth's mm. point. Well, I think that's one of the things when we talk about boundaries um, in the workplace, well, prior to the pandemic, we sort of had some boundaries there. We knew we, we went to the office, that's where we did our work. And then when we left, we had that wind down period on the commute and we come home and that's our, our space. And sure, there was a, a, a little overlap with some emails and stuff like that. But the boundaries have really, I guess, disappeared in the current environment and almost to the point where it's not only about technology, that notion of presenteeism that we had when we were in the office and we thought we had gotten away from. Now we're talking about digital presenteeism being being front of mind for people. And I think it's it's really fascinating how that's going to play out. I mean, I think with everything that's happened and, you know, with different countries now looking at returning to work at some point in time, what does digital wellness need to look like in the corporate world? And Amy, we'll, I'll, I'll continue with you here. Sure. Yeah. So, I, you know, when we think about um, one of the things you, you, you said, Safi, that's so important is, is sort of this this blurred line and, and what we want to avoid being presenteeism. So I think one real essential piece of this conversation is around progress. Um, we, we have been looking at a lot at the research of what creates a great employee experience. And we found that progress is one of the main uh, elements of helping employees feel engaged in what they're doing. And when I apply that to the concept of digital wellness, well, we can get our minds around what ways can we show progress to employees and what ways can we help them feel that they are making progress throughout their day? Um, that becomes a really interesting dynamic and, and one that I think has a huge opportunity to be a very positive dynamic uh, with, with technology involved. No, that's right. Elizabeth? So, you know, one of the things that we've found is that the aspect of, uh, especially with return to work, right, the control and perceived control. And I think it, you know, ties in back to, I, I think, uh, could be the work you're doing with your PhD and Amy, what you described around the employee experience and how people are perceiving uh, what's driving them to come back to work or how they manage if they decide to go back to work or not. Um, and that uh, that choice or the intentionality of almost seeing the office as a pull space, right? Where people go there for a particular reason, that people go there to want to connect, want to collaborate, is actually a big shift we are seeing. Um, so to that extent, the you know the one the virtual the workplace is both the physical and the virtual. I think that's been established. And as we are returning to the physical workplace. Uh, organizations are finding that you have to kind of draw people back into it and give them something that they get out of coming in, you know, making that commute in. Um, so I think that is kind of a big shift, which is obviously impacting not just the physical, you know, the commercial real estate, the physical spaces organizations are investing in, but also how they're pulling people back into it with how they're designing workspaces, with how they're designing collaboration zones, and how they're thinking about, you know, the mental construct of how people engage to do work, which requires, you know, a very different lens than we've had to use historically. And I think that's right. I think we're sort of entering a period where I think there's going to be a lot of change in what defines a workplace, be it physical or virtual, and, and how we also avoid having any party, be it someone in the office or, or remote, appear to be disadvantaged. You know, we want to have equality. So whether you're in the office or working from home or working for from wherever your access to technology, your ability to communicate, uh, collaborate and interact with your peers is equal. And I think that's the journey that, uh, um, you know, for me and the conversations I have with organizations, that that's what people are really exploring. Because at the moment, it's a bit disjointed. I have one experience in the office and a different experience when working from home. Um, uh, Khabibi, I think it'd be interesting to get your perspective, just, just given where you're from. Um, definitely. I agree with both of what has already been said, but I think um, from Herman Miller's point of view, we also look at digital wellness from a tech healthy perspective. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about, you know, good ergonomics and what does that mean when we're thinking about hybrid workplaces and people who are going to be uh, permanently stationed back in the office versus the flex group of people who are going to be coming out and what that feels like for both groups. 
uh, as well as you know equalizing that experience on the other side of the camera if you happen to not be able to be in attendance just making sure that every employee is equipped with the the basics to keep themselves comfortable and physically healthy but also to have um, you know we're advocating a lot of training and retraining around how we engage with technology how much time we spend on it um, what kind of pacing we take with it so that people start to learn a new behavior um, in this new world. Yeah, and, I think, and I think that's really important. Uh, I think at, at home for most of us, our studies or the place where we do some work was more a, a casual uh, position. You know, the chair may, may not have been the best, the lighting, the desk, the positioning. And, you know, when you're on there eight, nine, 10, whatever hours a day, back to back, you know, I definitely think more and more people need to take that seriously. And, and, and I'm sure people have suffered from physical, mental fatigue just as a result of that. I think it's been interesting to see how different people, you know, from some of the conversations I've had, I saw a couple of organizations really try and push employees who are working from home to take care of themselves as well. They, one bank I was talking to actually introduced digital wellness bingo. Mm. And so every week they had laid out a series of activities, which was, you know, go for a walk or do this or exercise or whatever mixture of activities and they played bingo like that. And I thought that was a, a fun way to get people and remind people of the importance of just, just taking a break. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been interesting how different people have embraced that. And Safi, if I could add on to that, I think one of the real elements is we think forward to the future. You know, what are we going to do with this? There is that idea of permission. So I hear you highlighting, you know, some some things that organizations have set up to intentionally guide and give permission to try new things. For example, um, we we've been doing a lot of listening within Citrix, and some of the things that have really surfaced is just changing the environment, you know, something as simple as a manager offering to an employee, let's take our one on one outside on a walk together. Several employees have really cited that as this moment that changed everything in that relationship with a manager to take away some of the formality and go a little more informal, a little more analog, um, and to, to leave some of that technology behind in, in so many ways seem to be a signal that they could bring more of themselves into a specific situation. No, and I think that's a good point. Uh, I definitely think the permission aspect is almost the most important one because I think employees, you know, uh, they want to make sure they have job security. They see, you know, uh, different industries being impacted as a result of, you know, the lockdown and COVID-19. And so people almost over rotate on being present and, and visible. You know, I've heard many stories of employees, you know, making sure they're their collaboration tools and teams and things like that aren't showing them as offline or away because they don't want people to think that during the day they're not working. So that permission thing is really important. And it sort of lends me to my, the, the next question is the role of leadership. Uh, and I think it's so incredibly important in, in this climate, the role of leaders. So that, that's where I wanted to head to next is, you know, how should leaders uh, address employee wellness and and, and mental health. And, and to your point, Amy, make sure that people feel like they have the permission to take a break and and take five minutes for, or 10 minutes for themselves. Uh, we'll start with you, Amy. So um, I just really explicitly saying the words, it's okay not to be okay. Yeah. And I think the storytelling, I especially during times of crisis um, or challenge or even pioneering something that we've never experienced before, bringing our own narratives and, and talking through times that where maybe we've struggled or we've tried something different. Um, I just shared a story on a, a Citrix.com blog where I, f I was not feeling okay one day and I made the choice to take a 20 minute nap at one o'clock in the afternoon. And for me, that was unprecedented. I've, 
I've never given myself permission to do that. Mm. But those 20 minutes changed the rest of my day. It made it so much more productive. I was in a much better headspace to solve problems. And in the end, I know my employer would prefer I make a choice like that and feel empowered to make a choice like that because in the end, I'm delivering better results. And no. so the more that we can share our own stories um, and get those messages out, I think not only do we exchange information and ideate together, um, hearing what works for somebody who's generated great ideas to try that for myself as well. But we're also giving permission by sharing those stories and being open and vulnerable in, in some of that. No, that's right. Kabibi? I, I think that's a wonderful and I, I'm just going to share some examples that like really lit me up inside because I could tell that the tides were turning. So, you know, within Herman Miller, we have basically all the digital wellness we could handle at our fingertips. And so they really ramped up on those offerings and making sure that we covered every bucket possible to take care of ourselves. But then there were the little moments that uh, really mattered the most, like seeing a work team leads out of my, uh, out of office message and it says I'm taking a break to replenish my energy and that gave me permission to follow suit and I remember going out on a vacation where I wasn't doing much of anything and someone asked you know what fun thing are you going to do and I got this moment of like oh my god I got I don't know if I should tell them I'm not doing anything that doesn't sound right but where am I going to go it's COVID right now and so I finally just bit the bullet and said you know what, I'm just gonna take some downtime because I need it. I need to just not answer emails, not pick up your phone calls for a few days, and I'll be back much more refreshed. And uh, I think the most outstanding example has been LinkedIn's week off, which really blew me away. You know, I, I dove right into that story, like, well, why are they getting a week off? And you know, how everyone's getting a week off. So I think that's a really bold move in the right direction. It ne won't necessarily work for every organization, but I think, you know, we're going to be brave by other organizations being brave and showing us the way that things could be. No, that's true. That's true. Elizabeth. Yeah. You know, that, that really resonates with me because, you know, and, and what you said too, with that, what people say and obviously what they do like LinkedIn and, you know, what leadership um, does. I mean, I think there are three things that I found, uh, you know, both personally and in, in the work that we've been doing, um, you know, the, the role of leaders in the, you know, in one authenticity, uh, transparency and, you know, personalization and I think ties to employee experience as well um, has always been true, right? I mean, leaders always, in order to appear authentic, they have to be authentic. They have to share, they have to, you know, provide messages or moments or benefits or, you know, whatever aspects that an individual might need. So there needs to be that level of personalization. And that what, that's what makes a leader good when they understand what people need, what each person needs. And I think to those principles of, um, you know, really making sure that especially in the digital world, uh, in the virtual world, the connection through authenticity, through personal authenticity is magnified, is really, really important. Um, and you know what we found is that you know leaders can say things and encourage people, but it's most effective when they do it and then talk about it. So that transparency to say you know I took a nap, right? As a, as a leader is is more important than saying you're free to go take a nap, right? Uh, which people are less probably likely to adopt. And I, I thought Amy, that was a brilliant example. Um, so similar, so I think when we're finding that leaders are transparent about their own experiences, that actually builds that connection and that authenticity, uh, because everybody needs something different from their leadership and from wellness. Everyone's in a different place. Um, so if you're able to kind of calibrate that, that is what makes the big difference we're finding, especially you know in, in, in the virtual world. And I think that point that you raised just there about leading by example is so important. I mean, leaders need to demonstrate and almost over rotate on demonstrating, you know, how they're feeling, the challenges they're going through and even not and taking a break as well. I mean, because what you don't want is a, a leader to encourage people to turn off their computers in the evening and not do email, but then they're sending emails at 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. or 10 p.m., which sort of is confusing for people you know does that mean i need to be working as well he's working and and, and that's i think it's so important you know leaders really need to lead from the front on, on this one 
Yeah, and just one of the plug this stuff, you know, especially now for parents and, you know, everybody's struggling, right? But especially parents and working women, uh, we, we've, IBM's done a number of studies around, you know, how gender balance is impacted by COVID. Um, so that being said, um, you know, especially for, uh, you know, working parents to be able to feel like they can make, you know, those adjustments is really, really important, not just for productivity, but, you know, for mental health as well and, um, and for keeping your workforce in the workforce uh, yeah. we've seen a big exodus of you know women from the workforce and uh, kind of a plateauing of opportunity so if organizations want to kind of you know address all of those things um all the thoughts you know amy and kbb you're describing those have to be addressed for very practical reasons no that's right and so just, just staying with you elizabeth you know just talking about leaders um you know obviously we need to demonstrate it we need to lead by example but how do we ensure that uh, we're engaging with, with those employees, you know, making sure that our employees and our staff actually are, are having those social connections as well. And it's not just all Zoom meeting, uh, work, 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 work. But, you know, in the workplace, when we were there physically, there's all these opportunities for social interaction. You, you know, I feel, you know, the five minutes before a meeting and the five minutes after the meeting are the most important parts of the meeting because that's yes. when you connect with people. Uh, the water cooler chats, the the quick coffee and things, all those things have gone and we're back to back meetings and things like that. So how do leaders ensure that that engagement is happening, that social connection is happening? So there are a few things and I'd love to hear everybody else's ideas too. You know, we've done a few things. Uh, we've done virtual wine tastings as a team. Um, you know, wine gets delivered, uh, virtual happy hours, everybody brings their own, you know, glass of beer or wine or beverage of choice. So there are some things that you can still do in the virtual world. We've also actually done even virtual scavenger hunts, right? So um, so the the events or the activities are many, and I'm sure there are you know much more brilliant ideas than those as well, which I'd love to hear about. Um, but I think what's behind it is the point Amy said, the intention, right? So if you're seeking to connect, you can connect, well, maybe not, you know, absolutely the same way we did before but there are works workarounds um you know i've personally tried to have lunch with people who live nearby who might be in the city you know now now that it's kind of open air um so that's one way to connect uh, on a personal level um, and i think what leaders need to remember in all of this is that you know we get as much out of human interaction as employees do you know energy is a two-way street right so when leaders connect you know you get back that positivity and energy that fuels you on. So I just wanted to mention that because that is connected to intention and you know, uh, ultimately like you know, what, what motivates people, right? So if they can think about that and marry that with the intention, I think it, it's much more productive. No, that's right. Kabibi? You know, I was just thinking, you know, what kinds of things have I been encouraged to do since this last year? And I, I didn't recognize it as that until you guys started talking. But just even uh, during every work team lead meeting or if I'm speaking to someone with senior leadership, I'll get a question asked, like, who have you connected with recently? Um, because they're just trying to make sure that we're still maintaining the connections that mean the most to us. I cover a pretty big area, so it could be assumed that I may be isolated. Um, but I also have been encouraged to just serendipitously start to make connections within the organization the way I would if we were all back in the office. And uh, I've done that by asking each person that I connect with to tell me someone else that I should meet. And that's actually begun one of the funnest things about my days and weeks now is not know, you know, just meeting a new person that uh, I wouldn't normally have met. No, that's right. And I think it's those spontaneous moments of connection that you get in the office, someone new starts. I mean, imagine, I mean, I can imagine it'd be very difficult to onboard a new person during this period. Like you just don't have that P network around you. Um, Amy? So this connection question was one of the earliest places. I, I think there was energy when the pandemic uh, mm -hmm. first, first hit us. And it was tied to culture oftentimes of so, you know there was this big question of how do we main, maintain culture in this virtual world and one of the things that i love about what the pandemic has challenged us with is it's caused us to 
to think about that. How did we maintain culture before? You know, the, the fact is that we didn't. We uh, kind of used these spontaneous connections almost as a proxy for culture. But if you think about what happened in that connection, it was trust. And I do think that there is an energy. Trust has an energy. And um, when, when I started to, to think about, well, how do, how do we maintain culture in a virtual world? Or even what do we mean when we say connection? Because I would put a, a modifier in front of that. Yeah. I think people are hungry for meaningful connection. And, and the meaningful comes in those moments of trust, whether it's a piece of information that's personal that, that we share with each other and, and it's reciprocated. Um, whether it is, I, one thing I did that was amazing over the summer was um, held a Dare to Lead book club. So Brene Brown's book, Dare to Lead, which it, you get into some meaty stuff about vulnerability and having sort of the safe space to go with colleagues. And honestly, we wouldn't have done that if we were all together in our office. There wouldn't have been really a driving force to intentionally create these spaces where we could still benefit from, from those trust connections. But I do think the challenge that's ahead of us is still here around connection um, because the, the, it seems that the population is sort of tired of the Zoom happy hours and they're kind of like, well, that was good at the beginning, but now I want something different and more. And so this, this idea of informality, you know, it is that hallway conversation or the five minutes after the meeting, there was some signal there that said we can let down the formality and and be be real in a different way with each other. You know, the after the meeting conversation is usually, well, this is what I really thought of that, you know? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it's as HR uh, leaders and, and folks in this space, managers, it's a fun enigma to try to experiment with. You know, what are those trust building moments and how do we create more of those informal exchanges where we can really elicit what we're all missing when it comes to connection? No, I think, and I think that's so right. Sorry, was someone gonna jump in there? Oh, I was actually just gonna expound on that because I think what we're also learning um, is that, you know, when it comes to connection, people go about it in different ways. And so I have heard a lot of feedback from people that this time has been their most socially connected moment yeah. because there's some safety to being behind the screen and not having to make any social faux pas or not having to approach someone in a group of people that you don't know or you know try to approach someone who's high, a higher level in the organization than you and all that anxiety that comes with it. So I think that's one of the positives that virtual connection has kind of leveled the playing field for some people and uh, made it a much more comfortable space for them to socialize. Yeah, no, no, no. And I think that that's definitely right. I think for some people it's made it easier for others who are used to and absolutely need the physical connection. It's made it more difficult. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's going to be interesting how people find that balance. Now, sort of shifting gears a little, we've been talking about the role of leaders and, you know, we started to touch on what employees can do. And I really wanted to dig into that a bit more as, you know, just getting your thoughts on what advice you can give to employees to avoid burnout. And I think that's a very real thing that that we all face um, on, on a regular basis. And I think we've had our ups and downs. But Elizabeth, maybe we'll start with you there. You know, what can employees do to avoid burnout? That is a big question um, and a good question, right? Um, and I think that it kind of applies to everybody. What can we all do to avoid burnout? I think the first is, you know, recognizing that we all have different needs. We're all in a different place, right? Some people are, you know, have kids, some have no kids, they have other responsibilities. So I think that aspect of, um, you know, for, from an organizational perspective, helping employees understand what their requirement is. That's the first step. Right. And the second is to really articulate or help them articulate what they need. Um, and then the third is, you know, really building out ways in which you can kind of bridge that gap between what they, you know, where they're at and what they need. Um, and, and, you know, whether, you know, organizations do this in a thoughtful, proactive <clears throat> fashion or not, you know, employees and individuals can do that for themselves, right? Knowing kind of what your needs are. Some people need to physically, you know, walk from one room to another to start their day. Some people don't, some people, you know, change clothes. Some people have their ritual around what those, how they define those boundaries. So I think that aspect of, you know, self-knowledge and reflection needs to, is almost core to wellness across the board. And I think that's become even more important in, you know, in, in these circumstances. Absolutely. Kabibi? 
Um, I, I talk to people about this all the time, and one of the first things that I recommend, if, especially if they're feeling overwhelmed by the technology use, is to reorganize the way that they use technology. Everything from turning off all of those notifications that are uh, firing up our, our fight or flight response and making us anxious, um, just figuring out a different way to see your, your day, your week digitally, taking more control over your calendar, um, not letting people, you know, bombard your calendar with meetings, but really kind of setting the tone for how you want your day to go with as much, you know, control as we might have, because some of us don't have as much control there. Um, so that's one thing, you know, just getting your, your digital life a, a detox, so to speak, and figuring out what is really driving you crazy and what is really helpful to, to getting some good productivity done during the day. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. And it sort of links back to, I think, the point that Amy made around permission. You need to feel that you've got permission to do that, to be able to block some time to say, hey, this is my me time to do my focus work. And, and I love what you mentioned about turning off notifications. I mean, I think while technology is used everywhere for so many different things and it ha adds a lot of value, the amount of technology that we deal with in the workplace is just astounding and just the constant barrage of notifications, message, there's so many different channels and just that noise and, and, and that it creates is, I guess, can really drive anxiety that, you know, how do I respond to this? How do I keep working through the day when I'm just, it's, it's never ending? Yeah, and I think, you know, helping people to understand that it is a natural human response to feel overwhelmed by that and that it's going to be different for each person. You know, some people may not be so bothered by it, but if you're very sensitive to noise and just, and you're, you have a hard time focusing anyway, that's not helping, you know, you might be notified about something, but it's not helping whatever it is that you were working no, on. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I heard an interesting, uh, I heard an interesting statistic today that um, the average knowledge worker is interrupted every 45 seconds with an at least one notification. Um, and so when we think about the fatigue of that and some of that context switching and do I need to pay attention to this, you know, one of the things that's really bubbling up in our research is um, explicit norms with teams. So very few of us have um, a role where we're isolated to work by ourselves. So we really are talking about a whole team experience. And for many, um, that team is, is spread across the globe. So how do we decide together? You know, what are our core hours? How do we get in touch with each other? Um, when should we sign off at the end of the day and call it a day? We're, we're hearing a lot about that from Gen Z who if you think, you know, they're coming in, many of them at a university, this is the first role in a, in a professional setting that they've had. They're looking around trying to figure out the way to be successful and how things work here. And we just need to be very intentional in, in talking through what are those expectations and is it okay to stop sending email at 10 o'clock if your boss happens to send something through? You know, so that permission, we're coming right back there in my mind, but just making sure that we're all understanding the implications of what it is we do when we're trying to get our job done, knowing that that creates a need for response from someone else and being very empathetic and understanding, even though we don't mean that they have to get it to us at 10 o'clock, have we said that? Um, or do we need to get together as a team and really just talk through expectations of each other? And how often do we need to refresh that? Um, going in from a, a full remote work style into more of a hybrid work style is going to be a call for a great refresh because there's a lot of transition that's about to happen um, and the more that we can be very explicit about that the better off we all are in trying to find our way through it yeah no, that's right and look while i've got you amy i think it sort of lends into the the, the other topic we just touched on uh just then is around the role of technology and, you know, we've talked about at the moment technology being a bit of a bad guy with its notifications and, and disruptions. How can technology be an asset? You know, how can technology help us make sure that, you know, employees are healthy and, and, and taking the time out for themselves? And, and I know, Amy, you've been involved in some, some R&D and project work internally that we've been doing. 
Yeah, thank you, because this is also so exciting when we think about the possibilities for technology. Certainly through the pandemic, we saw the emergence of platforms that really help with well-being, whether it's behavioral design, whether it's meditation apps. You know, we've come to integrate technology on our own well-being journeys, and I think that's the key is the integration. If we can meet employees where they are and where they're spending their day and intersect that day with some um, guidance, some tips, some notifications around well-being in our Citrix workspace, which is really the one-stop shop for everything you'll need to do during your day. Um, forget kind of signing in to four different SaaS applications. You can do all of that without that disruption and friction point through workspace. But it also has intelligence to send messages, you know, surprise and delight people, um, notify them that they, they've they been online for quite a long time and would they like to spend five minutes in a quick meditation? So we're really looking at ways to bring well-being to the employee as part of their digital experience versus the employee feeling like it's something separate from how they're interacting with technology throughout the day. And I think what I like about the, the work we're doing there is it's not making a forceful approach, it's a nudge. Hey, what about this? Uh, and it's been it's, it's been really great, great to see that. Elizabeth, your thoughts? So, you know, technology is, is is a wonderful thing when it works and when it's used for good, and when you, when we decide intentionally how to use it. So, I'll preface it with that. You know, being from IBM, um, and our work, uh, you know, especially now more so than ever, centers on the idea that you know, humanity or people at the heart of everything, and then technology kind of wraps around, right? So when we kind of keep that as our North Star, um, you know, technology can help us connect people, right? It provides these virtual collaboration mechanisms. It is providing, you know, amazing connectivity as we've all experienced, right? Whether it's social media or, you know, using applications, connecting with people, you know, many worlds uh, ago, right? Uh, whether it's high school, so all of that happens, those relationships. So the networks that we're building through technology are much more, uh, you know, widespread or disseminated. So there is that part of it. Um, I think, um, you know, on the, on the flip side of it, uh, maintaining the strength of those networks and you know what the health of those networks and those connections is what you know you can use or need to use technology for more so one is you know when you using it to ensure that that your own personal health and wellness you know whether it's by shutting off or using meditation apps is one part of it and using it to maintain the health of your networks and those connections by you know either adding to them uh, you know, physical interactions or different ways of connecting. So those things are very, very important, as, as, especially as more technology being used. Um, and I think the, you know, the, the last, well, two other quick points around that, right? Technology is able to now provide more transparency and visibility into learning, into employment opportunities, into progress. So that's a very positive thing that, you know, employees and organizations have embraced. And with that is coming this democratization of expertise it doesn't really matter where you sit you know we can still be on this you know um, recording together we're all in different places it doesn't matter whether you're you know in Africa or in India if you have skills that can code or um, teach you can access opportunities so you know some of those aspects are very very significant and um, you know as leaders and organizations we kind of have to look at technology with the big picture and ensure that we're helping organizations and employees navigate you know, all that potential um, along with, you know, all these tools we need as individuals, as people um, to stay healthy and, uh, you know, functional in, in that kind of a, of a man of an at landscape. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely think, think there's some long lasting impacts to how we think about people and just where we look for talent. And historically, it was just in the, the confines of who lives within proximity to a physical office, whereas now, now that we've been given, employees are given permission to work remotely and we trust them to do that and that trust perception that trust aspect is really important we can now open up and and i think elizabeth you're absolutely right i think this has re real potential to change the dynamics of where people live how people find their work how they balance out their personal lives and work lives and it's going to be a, i think a fascinating journey over the coming decade to see what the long lasting impacts of of this is because for so long we've built our entire lives around the routine of work. 
you know, where we live, where we study, what our after work routine is, what our weekend routine, it's all built around that routine of work. And now we've, we've got an opportunity, and I think all of you have touched on it, to realize the humanity uh, that we're actually people and we need to be able to connect with our families and our community. And and that aspect is, is I think it's great to see that sort of rise in importance through this this lockdown experience. So I think the next thing I wanted to touch on was, you know, we've talked about leaders, we've talked about employees, you know, how do leaders encourage productivity and make sure that employees find that balance? You know, I think we've all agreed that permission is a really important thing that employees feel like they've got the ability to make that choice of I'm going to take a break. But is there any guidance that you feel we can give to the audience on what leaders can do to, to make sure they're getting uh, the productivity they need from their employees and the quality of work is good, but at the same time being mindful uh, of the well-being of the employee? Uh, can we maybe, maybe we'll start with you on that one. Um, so I think uh, just a little bit from the last question and that kind of leads into this question, I think that there is um, a lot of data that technology gives us that leaders can use to make future decisions or even now decisions about, you know, the way the organization is, is working, initiatives that maybe are not uh, as fruitful as they thought. And if we even think about the technology that helps us reserve a meeting room, you know, what kind of decisions can we make from all of that data about the way our organization is uh, behaviorally operating in a hybrid work environment. Um, Herman Miller has been, you know, using technology and height adjustable tables to give that nudge from sit to stand quite frequently. And uh, that can help also to see like what utilization are people actually using the equipment that you provided. And if not, then you can properly intervene with some kind of a training or more of a, a why that's important. So I think that technology definitely delivers in that way. And um, I also think that you know, if leaders are, are tapping into their leadership circle and making sure that they're aggregating all of that data and feedback that they're getting from their teams, as well as the live feedback. I don't, I don't know about you guys, but you know, my teams have been very vocal about how they're feeling, um, what kind of experience they're having. And I think everyone has taken the charge, not just the leadership, but everyone's taken the charge of filtering that up as much as possible because we care about each other and we want to make sure that no one, you know, falls to the wayside during this time frame. No, that's right. That's right. Elizabeth? You know, I think one of the things leaders have really had to do or, or should be doing is, is to lead more and do less. Um, and, you know, always, of course. Uh, but I think now even more so, you know, being that example, being vulnerable, providing that perspective, that North Star is actually much more critical than the task. Um, and, and it's important. And, you know, and, and who's a leader, right? Everybody is really a leader within our organizations. It's not just the CEO. So I think it's recognizing that, you know, we all have a role to play in our teams. We all bring leadership and, you know, qualities to, the, to, the, to every meeting. Um, and using that opportunity to connect and, you know, ask, find out how people are doing, uh, creating empathy and connection, I think is, is a big part of everybody's job um, you know, as leaders, especially for, you know, organizational senior leaders. So I think those two aspects of, uh, you know, one, how you're operating, what you're prioritizing, and also how people are seeing themselves and encouraging people to see themselves differently is a big part of what, you know, we're seeing um, uh, needing to come to the forefront. Yeah, so, I think there's a couple of things that, that really come to mind. One is um, making sure that in addition to talking about productivity, we're also emphasizing effectiveness. So I think one of the, the real shifts that we want to make sure is front and center is it's not the industrial age. We're not you know, machines, cogs in this grandiose assembly line. Um, we are humans and it's not as much about activity as it is about outcomes. And, you know, the research is really pointing to that's one of the big success pillars for hybrid is a, a real clear focus on outcomes, being clear about what the expectation is, allowing autonomy to get there, um, and, and making sure that people are focused on the right things because there's so many things, but are they the right things? And I think there's an element 
element of education, both for leaders and for employees about how to prioritize. What criteria are we going to use to make sure it's not only the urgent, but it's also the important that's getting done? And at the end of the day, how are we going to measure success? Um, and all that to say as well is, you know, I think caring for our leadership population, our people managers, is really critical. Um, our, our middle managers felt the brunt of the transition to a pandemic. Um, I, I think about this, you know, care for the people who care for others. And so managers are, are really right in the middle and we need to care for them too. So um, just being intentional about that, saying thank you, appreciating that role of the manager, which has been underappreciated in my mind for years. Um, but these are the critical pivot points within organizations and they also are very unique in, in the needs that they have um, managing up and managing to, to more junior employees. So I think there's an opportunity there. And I like what you said there about the, the looking after the managers because I think in some ways they can take on the burden of digital wellness challenges, fatigue from all of their staff, right? Because it's always front of mind to them. And I think that's a really important point. Uh, I think that's sometimes forgotten. We put priority on employees, which is absolutely the right thing, but we need to prioritize the employee leaders as well. And I want to sort of d double down on another point you made, which I think is really important, that shift from measuring productivity uh, from hours to output. I, that's just so important. You know, I think the, the measurement of hours is like the old days of, of clocking in and clocking out. And that's how we measure have they actually done their work. And, and, and I think in today's world, with the role that technology plays and, and the way work is conducted in general, in, in, in most cases, it, it can be focused on output. And I think if we make that shift, I think we'll all find the output will actually be of a higher quality because we're not putting that pressure of hours on there. So no, I definitely think that's a good one as well. So I think, you know, in and amongst all this, you know, I think, uh, you know, I touched on in the beginning that digital wellness was a topic that had been talked about, but often it was just a message coming out from HR, you know, a broadcast message, and that there wasn't really that mainstream recognition that this was an important thing. Now, do you think that with everything that's happened with COVID and, and lockdown that, you know, there's a much better understanding and appreciation of it amongst the general population? Khabibi? Uh, I definitely think we cannot put Pandora back in her box. And, um, you know, we've all seen, we've all seen one that we can work productively and effectively from home if we choose. Um, but we've also gotten to take a really close look at our behaviors uh, with the way that we work. And the people in our homes have also gotten to take a close look at our behaviors and the way that we work. And I'm sure there's been some commentary and feedback um, from those people as well. So um, <laughs> I think the way forward, there are many possibilities for change. And, um, you know, I, I look forward to helping to usher some of them in, but also just being witness to how all of this pans out. <laughs> no, that's right, that's right. Elizabeth? Yeah, I, I do agree. Everything was clearly said, you know, I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I think also in addition to that, you know, there's a more practical understanding, you know, from HR and, and managers, the people managers or middle managers, you know, lower level managers about how important it is to have those conversations and how important that topic is to even understand and be cognizant of. So I think there's been a much more, you know, uh, much more realistic uh, understanding of the things that HR has said for a long time and uh, you know hopefully a much more practical application of some of those concepts and things that we've, we've been encouraging uh, you know organizations to be doing as HR professionals. No that's right it's like finally people realize they were right they were talking about it. <laughs> I should have listened to them. I should have listened that's right. Um, Amy? So one of the greatest aspects of, of what we've been through in the last 13 months has been empathy for colleagues who were always remote. You know, I think that's been one of the greatest epiphanies is suddenly there's an understanding of what it's like to not be in the room. And I am excited to see, and I'm, I'm optimistic, I may be a bit idealistic too, but to see how that changes in a hybrid work style. Um, 
Will we have more empathy? Will we be more inclusive in our conversations? Will we make sure that there's equity and that there's shared airtime? Um, I have hope that the answer will be yes and that we will all behave slightly differently having had this experience with technology being our only link, which many of our colleagues who have been 100% remote for years, it's been their only link. And they've had to adjust um, to the majority who have been co-located together. And and so what happens next in us adjusting to each other and finding our way collectively through what great looks like on the other side of, of this, which is looking good for hybrid. You know, I think I, I read a stat that we're anywhere between 40 to 60 percent of employees plan to be um, in a hybrid work style once they have the opportunity to, to do that in different research points to different numbers. Um, but that's certainly similar to what we've seen in our, our surveys at Citrix. And so how we do that well is the next great endeavor yeah and i think i just want to flow on from that point uh amy you talked about around going back to work and hybrid being the likely model that most people will embrace i think you know as all of us depending on what country we're in we're in a different stage of what our return to work strategy will be how it's going to play out you know, I think with everything we've talked about, with everything we've gone through over the last 12, 18 months with lockdown, working from home, you know, all that burnout, what do you think some of the um, life lessons and, 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 and lessons generally people can take as we think about how we return to work and, and, and what are some of the things we're going to keep doing and keep and retain because it was a benefit and, and what may we drop off? Um, Khabibi, I'll start with you. I really hope that we carry forward people's, um, you know, attention to prioritizing self and self care. I think that that has been okay during this time frame, and I would hate to see that drop back into the norm of pre-COVID because I think that that it was the most tremendous shift that we experienced was that it became okay to take care of yourself. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's that's probably the most important one is that we remember we're not machines; we're people. <laughs> I think that's that, that's the, the such an important aspect there, uh, Elizabeth. As uh, technology is going to, you know, only ratchet up in its use, you know, even in the hybrid world, just the past year has uncovered more uses of technology, more ways in which we can be virtual and connect and do things we didn't think we could do before, right? So that pace is only going to increase. In fact, I sometimes tell people, you know, savor this moment you're in because. This is the slowest life, as you know, is going to be. Every moment after this is going to be faster. So that aspect of technology is going to be front and center. So in that context, you know, keeping the person, keeping humanity at the heart of everything we do is going to be really, really critical. And I think HR organizations, HR functions are really the keepers of the flame on that account. You know, we're the ones who have to be the heart of the organization and remind people about what's important. So I think that's very important, and I hope that continues you know, on, on forward. And then I do have a second, and that is the aspect of leadership. I think the pandemic has really shown us what leadership means and what happens when people lead and they don't lead. So I think for organizations, as they think about, you know, who needs to be a leader, who should be a leader, looking at, you know, those aspects of authenticity, transparency, true integrity and competence are going to be critical in navigating all these changes that are still going to come at us. There's going to be more of, you know, what we experience. So um, I just wanted to, you know, so th those would be the two things I'd leave us with humanity at the heart of it all and, you know, true leadership. Uh, that was very insightful. And I think you raised a good point there around just, I think, well, we've gone through this period. I absolutely agree. We're about to enter a period of change just in change in terms of what's normal, adoption of technology, uh, the way businesses operate, the way we interact, it's, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out. Amy, uh, your final thoughts? Sure, yeah. So I, I think one thing that I, I do hope carries forward is this idea of partnership. Um, changing so quickly as, as organizations had to at the onset of the pandemic was 
organizational partnership galore. Um, you know, people kind of putting aside anything else that, that they had intended to work on and coming together in cross-functional teams in a very agile fashion with laser focus and getting it done. Um, so I do hope that that continues. And especially the partnership with um, real estate, IT, and HR being really those three pillars of employee experience, looking at all those touch points an employee has across those domains and working together to find find the friction points and remove it as, as best as possible. And then the other piece is um, what we've discovered about ourselves, how incredibly resilient it turns out that all of us are. Um, we faced grief in such big ways and kind of this idea of collective trauma. Um, and yet we all have uh, pushed through that and we've found different ways to cope. We've had good days and we've had bad, but that continued experimentation and really I believe this emotional uh, evolution that has taken place in, in these last uh, months behind us to, to show us what's possible and to really leverage our re resilience um, to move into the future instead of holding on to the past. And, and I think on that note, I mean, I think that res resilience aspect has been just astounding. I mean, you, you think about the scale of what's happened and the fact that we've all been able to, for the most part, persevere and, and move forward. And that, that really comes back to just how powerful we, we are as people uh, to deal with all the things that happen. All right, well then, so with that, I wanna thank everyone for attending this episode of The New Workspace and thank you to all of you, uh, Elizabeth, Kabibi and Amy. I really enjoyed the discussion. I think we, we could have probably chatted for another hour or so on, on this topic. Probably. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and to everyone else, uh, remember that all the episodes in this series can be watched on demand and the links to those episodes are gonna be found in the section below. And so with that, bye for now.